Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. In India, I met farmers whose crops have been literally washed away by historic flooding. In America, I have witnessed unprecedented droughts in California. In Greenland and in the Arctic, I was astonished to see that ancient glaciers are rapidly disappearing, well ahead of scientific predictions. All that I have seen and learned on my journey has absolutely terrified me. So the question now is whether we will have the courage to act before it's too late, and how we answer will have a profound impact on the world that we leave behind, not just to you, but to your children and to your grandchildren. As a president, as a father, and as an American, I'm here to say we need to act. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All right, welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Is it Angie? Where's Jim and, and uh, Jesse and I'm back, Angie? baby. I'm back. Although... <laughs> You're back. You're back. My spirit still resides in Michigan. Summertime's in yeah, Michigan. I, know, I don't know I if know. it gets much better than that. So, but I'm in Florida yeah. and it's it's hot and raining a lot, yeah. but everything's green and brilliant in color. So that's fun. Yes. That's really fun. And yeah, it's just well, good to... It's cold here and it's raining a lot. <laughs> And it's green everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we definitely don't have the cold. No, no. That that Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that actually sounds kinda nice. But probably not if you're living in it. Yeah, no, it's nice. It's nice. It was a great week too here. In wonderful New Zealand. I mean it's New Zealand week. Oh. Right. So I was you know, we had Kiwi mm-hmm. on Tuesday. Doctor Taylor was yesterday. And now we have the news today, which I'm actually covering a lot of stuff with New Zealand. So it's just kind of. I a, think you're turning into a full fledged kiwi, Chris. All right, kiwis. Yeah, 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 kiwi. Yeah, I still think. I know we say kiwi is the bird. I still think a single individual New Zealander is a kiwi. I think that's fine. I agree with that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't kiwis. really yeah. have any reason to. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I have no I backing on it besides my gut, which is not a good place for a scientist to go with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. It's but true. it sounds right to me. Yeah, well, it's great you're back for the news, and you know I'm gonna I'm gonna take a week off at some point, and uh, you can talk to Jesse or, or Jim. Wine Ooh, Press, that sounds like great. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're both great, both great guys, and and we appreciate them covering uh, for us when we're off and about doing wonderful things. Yes. So you know, I've been tweeting out or actually Instagram again, Angie. You need to get Instagram. I have been posting a lot of cool pictures. I know. I need to. I need to get yeah. to get with the times. So I I will. I promise. Yeah. You just need our account. Just go into our Instagram account. I've got us covering. We're following a bunch of animal people groups. It's just the photos are amazing. They're just amazing. Are you following Leonardo DiCaprio? Yes. He's on. He's one of them for sure. Oh, yeah. That was like the first one. I'm like, this is also Angie's account. So, you know, we're following Leonardo. Um, Okay. but, But yeah, no, there's just so many cool organizations and they post such amazing photos so it's it's twitter on steroids so i barely go to twitter anymore really <laughs> okay okay well no it's good to know i uh well i think yeah. too as long as i just you just have to manage your social media time i can get lost in yeah. oblivion looking at like food recipes in slow motion yeah. and yeah. pets dressed up and yeah, all that all that different stuff and i think you just got to set time of like okay i'm only gonna, i'm only gonna be on it this much time so i can actually go outside and be in nature and yeah <laughs> no and i do i just you know because i mean i'm always looking at it and i'm managing our social media accounts but i i just enjoy when i'm have some time to sit there instead of going to facebook or reading the news well, i just go on there and i just look at the pictures it makes me feel so happy well exactly i think if you customize yeah. your different social media accounts to groups mm-hmm. that you like organizations that you want to support mm-hmm. information that of course you should always hear from 
uh, the, your opposing side or your opposing viewpoint. Right, right, right. But too much of that, especially here in the States for me, and I just get, I just yeah. get burnout. out. <laughs> total, total yeah, burnout. Yeah, yeah. And so, but yeah, but I found for my own social media accounts that I am on, I've just joined more groups that I like, like equine health. And I joined a, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. I'm such a dork. I joined a Michigan yeah. Great Lakes rocks and minerals. I'm, I am a big, I okay. love uh, yeah. collecting and hunt, hunting for rocks when I'm on the beach shores of Lake Michigan. So, oh, and I, uh, <laughs> another one is I joined old Michigan barns because I like just, I just oh, like looking cool, at, I grew up in with, old, I, I grew up in the, in the country with lots of yeah. barns on, on my folks' property. Yeah. So anyways, those, yeah, like you said, those pictures make me very happy. And so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which remind me, you you were talking about rocks and minerals. I got to post this uh, and I will, I'll post it on Facebook and in Instagram if I can. It's the pumice stone. Oh, cool. So, yeah, Lake Tapo had a bunch of them, and we had fun just picking them up and throwing them in and seeing these huge stones floating. <laughs> it's just, awesome. Yeah. Fun yeah. science. Yeah, so That's a, and so they, yes. they float because there's, like, air pockets in them? or Yeah, That's yeah. So cool. And then once they get waterlogged, they'll, they'll go back down. But I had this, like, one the size of my hand, and I just tossed it in Did there. Did you save any? It because floated. I feel like you could send them to me for John's feet. Like that could be what yeah. he uses. Yeah, I know. Yeah. They're yeah. really, I mean, I, take a couple, I got yeah. like, sweetie, you got to put some lotion yeah. on that. But because isn't pumice stone, yeah. don't some people use that to like, sm- I think so. I think so. They I do. Think so. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. It's crazy. I've never, I never knew it really did float and they do. They float. Uh, my boy Xander would, so, uh, that's all they did yeah. every day is we'd go to Lake Michigan and they would throw rocks. Yeah. And I try, I don't know if yeah, it's like yeah. little boys in general, but I tried to first say, okay, you can't throw rocks because you know, trying to be a good right. mom. And then I realized that was like a moot point. And so I was like, okay, all right. New rule. You can't throw rocks at people. Like you can still throw them in the water right, and right. do have fun with them. But yeah, you can't throw them at people. And so that's where we, we both mm-hmm. compromised and came together and they spent the whole past two weeks. Yeah. Throwing rocks into Lake Michigan and how yeah, cool yeah. it'd be if they, if one floated though, man, that would have rocked. Yeah. The world. Yeah. It was, Part, it was cool. Uh, it was did, you, did, you, did you catch that pun? Rock their world. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nice. Nice. No, I just say it. It's science. You know, it's like, what? you know, I, I, our banter is going on a little long, but it, it's just, we're talking about social media for the listeners and rocks you you and rocks and <laughs> and uh pumice stone so <laughs> you know but i do want to jump into some of the stories that that we picked to cover this week and i know you have a bunch to talk about which i'm excited to hear but i'm just going to you know kind of continue on with this new zealand week because i think if people listen to the kiwi episode and i know it's a little bit long but we do you know go into the department of conservation here how new zealand's unique how they're, the government is behind supporting saving endangered species, saving the environment. So that's why that one went a little bit long. And I think understanding the history of New Zealand and where they are today makes it really u- a unique situation. And your prime minister rocks you know? to keep the pun going. Yes. She yes, is a... Yes. Uh, Jacinda Ardoon. Is it, yeah. it is prime minister, She's amazing. right? Is that how you call it, say it? Yes. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. I want to be her. She's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, she is. She's she's much loved down here. I mean, yeah, you the other side, but politics down here is much nicer. It's, uh, you know, we're not trying to shoot or kill each other. Anyways, so this first story I, I talked about, Angie, I thought was really interesting. And the title is 10 Critically Endangered Critters with the Craziest Stories. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, and this is coming out of New Zealand. So i just going to highlight a couple of them, but I just thought it was... It got me thinking, you know, you and I know this, like we cover obscure species, you know, vampire squid. We cover some of these, these, these ones that people don't know a lot about, but we, we don't cover some of these. (laughs) So the first one, and these stories are really, really interesting, but again, it kind of goes into what the whole New Zealand thing is. So this one's called the open Bay Island leech. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's on one of the islands. It's unique to one of the islands off New Zealand. So they discovered this about a hundred years ago, very unique leech that feeds on penguins feet. So that's what they specifically <laughs> find. A, yeah. That's a specific so, niche. That's it, funny. It, yes, it, it is. It's the F- Fordland penguin. That's their, their target. And what happened is it's very similar, you know, across New Zealand, they, they actually brought in the Weka, which is a bird W E K A here, a flightless bird. 
And the Weka went and just ate up all these leeches. Now, the New Zealand government recognized that, so they got rid of all the Weka off the island. And the last time they saw this leech was on under a single rock uh, in the 90s. So they don't know where this leech oh. is anymore. So it okay. may still be there, but it could be extinct. So there's a a unique, you know, I guess the islands is just, it's so unique how an invasive species comes in. And again, who cares about a leech? Well, the things that eat leeches exactly. or, you know, what they're doing. Yeah. So there's one, the one they talk about is the three kings, Kakamako, Mak, uh, Kekam, mm-hmm. Kekam, Mako, Kekamako, that's it. So it's a, it's one of the rarest world tree species. It got down what? to one. There was only one left in the wild. Yeah. And it was a female tree and she's still alive, but since mm-hmm. it was a female tree and they thought it was going to go extinct, they have been able to cultivate okay. it a little bit, but similar to what like Dr. Taylor talked about, the genetic diversity is not there, but this is a tree, right? We don't even think about that. Right. Like I never thought about that. Yeah. Like, you know, tree genetics. I, I know there's people out there that study this stuff, but I never thought it was a little bit out of our comfort zone, but it it, it makes sense. It follows a similar pattern as far as getting down to one or two or even five can very be very cumbersome on yeah and make the genetic bottleneck not great yeah 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 for the plant so i thought that one was was interesting and then the the last one i i i thought was really cool was the the tiviat flathead galaxia and i don't even know what you're saying that, <laughs> yeah it's a it's a, one of our rare native fish here okay. it's it's an it's they live up to 20 years they're wow. fresh water cool the, right now, their population, and there's only a few of them left, is in an area about the size of a football field or football pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, they put obviously in New Zealand they put rugby pitch. So again, another one of these really obscure species that people don't hear about. Right, right. That's in danger. No, and so, it's awesome for you to bring it to our attention. And I would love to cover yeah. any of those species. <laughs> Probably the. Yeah, no, I think it's yeah. cool. Yeah, probably most the leech. I uh, have you ever had a leech yeah. on you? No, I no. have. No, I've been freaked out. It's not yeah. that bad. I wasn't. Yeah, I was a kid, so <laughs> yeah. When a kid, you're you're tough. We went swimming in the river. We stood around too long. Yeah, we got leeches. It happens. Oh no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. I freaked out when I first. I remember when I first had a tick on me. I was like, ah. Oh my gosh, you're such a baby. They're awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I I am. Ticks are awesome. Oh, yes. They have, they have their special niche and they don't, they, They I mean, I know they, They the problem is they, I wasn't aware of it, but in certain parts of the United States, the Lyme disease is on the incline. Right. Where I was never really worried about that issue. So I didn't mind pulling them off myself, my animals, my boys. They're really, you know, in Florida, they're pretty, uh, Michigan, they were bad this summer in Florida, out. they're horrific. Really uh, bad. So yeah. I just kind of have yeah. a decent relationship for them and try not to get all worked up and just remove them. Although, yeah, Ashley, yeah. your wife did teach yeah, me to, yeah. uh, I, I, the ones I pull off of me and the boys I save and I put in the freezer with the date yeah. on them. Yes. Yes. Just in case, like we did get sick, we could maybe see if they had Lyme's disease or whatnot. what did it what carries yeah, what, what they're yep. carrying yep. and so john's like can i throw out all he was cleaning the roof the freezer out he's like can i throw out all <laughs> these old ticks i'm like yeah i think they're fine <laughs> yeah yeah you know yeah. you're a dorky scientist win right uh yes yes but crystal so switching gears a little bit for my news for yep. my zoo news this week uh, i'd first like to celebrate that it's uh national zookeeper week here in the united states yay Yay. Uh, and I'm not sure internationally how that works. I don't think it is recognized internationally, but in the United States here, it's a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. All the U.S. Mm-hmm. zoos, especially the accredited zoos, are celebrating the people that keep their animals happy and healthy, which is awesome. I feel you and I do that, uh, but this is a week dedicated yep. to really focusing on zookeepers and what they do. And zoo- National Zookeeper Week starts annually on the third Sunday in July. And all mm-hmm. week, the different zoos will send out lots of love uh, to their zookeepers and t- through social media, of course. And they'll highlight and post all about their hard work and what species they specialize in. So if you're following any of your local zoos on social media, you've probably seen this already. But if not, definitely take a look because I, I, 
Chris and I have had a, f- a few different zookeepers on some of our mm. uh, interviews and people just love those interviews yeah. because it's such a intimate look at what it's like to care for those animals. Like when we had Jesse on right. doing our copies right. and things like that. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. anyways, these personal stories are awesome. The videos that they're making and um, for instance, the national zoo um, out of Washington, DC, they have a whole article called take a look inside the life of a zookeeper. So, and then, and then mm-hmm. the other, and the zoos will do different events and activities. And uh, for, we're going to John zoo this weekend because it's, because of National Zookeeper Week, they're having all sorts of games and prizes mm-hmm. and activities for the kids. Meet a zookeeper, uh, mm-hmm. pet animals, all that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, yeah. So, yay. So, celebrate that. Recognize that. To yay. all the people that work very, very hard for yeah. not only to take care of the animals and their care, but also really hard for conservation as well. So, there are definitely many, many heroes out there that get paid not very well. <laughs> Dude, does. No, it's a labor no, of love. You don't. So. <laughs> Um, and with, yeah, and it's hard work. Oh, it's crazy like, it's, it's hard, hard work. work. Yeah, a lot of my yeah. fellow yeah. zookeeper friends are. We're all starting to get a little older, mid thirties, you know, mid forties, yeah. and yeah, their biggest complaints are that their bodies are falling apart. And I, yeah. my, you know, in <laughs> my late twenties, mine was already starting to fall apart, which is why I went back to grad school. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, so thank you to all you zookeepers out there. Um, and mm-hmm. yeah, uh, for those of you that are zookeepers, our listeners, uh, let your local zoo in or zookeepers know that you love them. They do great work. But yeah, with, they do. They really do. But with that in mind, I also want to give a shout out to the Tulsa Zoo out of Oklahoma, in the United States. They are known for being able to hatch Aldebra tortoises. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Aldebra tortoises are a giant tortoise. And they're from the islands of Aldebra. And that's near in the Seychelles or Madagascar, Tanzania, so Eastern Africa area. And the Aldebra tortoise is vulnerable. And they, they're one of the longer living Animals, they can reach over 200 years of age, but researchers aren't really sure because they usually outlive the people that are doing the research on how long they live. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, so yeah, but the yeah. Tulsa Zoo has set a new record uh, as of this year. They've hatched 25 new Aldebra tortoises. And since they began breeding mm-hmm. them in 1999, they've hatched 161. And there, of course, the right. Tulsa Zoo is an, uh, accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or the AZA. And they are the only successful breeding program of this species right. in the world. Right, right. So, so and I think it just they're highlights... They're very, very important. Yeah. yeah, I think it just highlights what zoos do, you know? And I think Correct. that's just what the people that don't work in the zoo industry or even have a negative connotation towards zoos... The Tulsa Zoo, you know, the LA Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo. I mean, all are doing their part in conservation and breeding and saving endangered species. Like to me, yeah, that's, the Aldebra- that's the message, yeah, that I like to get out. Exactly. Yeah. And the Aldebra tortoise is vulnerable and its population is in decline in the wild. It's fragmented to these different islands. And there are, mm-hmm. of course, some protected areas, mm-hmm. but we all know even in protected areas, species are still can get into some trouble, uh, especially when their numbers are low too. All, you know, one, all it takes is one disease to wipe out mm-hmm. a whole population or, mm-hmm. you know, other, or, a, or a, um, a tsunami or, you know, different climatic shifts. So keeping right. this genetic bank in the zoos is definitely critical in order to help yeah. save these guys. The one that comes to my mind is just, you know, you're, we're talking about John Zoo, the, the Guam rail, right? Correct. So, you know, people that don't work in zoos think, oh, you know, it's just rhinos and elephants or, and maybe zebras, and that's not true. Like the Santa Fe Teaching Zoo and other zoos across the country have saved the Guam rail because of invasive species and snakes. Yeah, the have, Guam rail the, was functionally yeah. extinct in the wild. There were no more yeah. in the wild. Yeah, and, so the and because of the efforts of the Santa Fe Zoo and other zoos, that species is still here. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, and that's that's a, that's a bird that nobody knows about, or really not They're a lot so of people. Cool. Yeah. They remind me of like a small kiwi. Yeah. Yeah. I can They're see that. Flightless. Yeah. 
Uh, they're hard to find in the bush. Yep. Like at the even in the exhibit, Xander and I are always looking for them, and we like high five each other if we can actually spot them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're a lot smaller. They're like palm of your hand type bird. Yeah, yeah, and it's just you know it just shows what zoos are doing, and you know about species that that don't get on the radar like we just covered you know in New Zealand. So. Mm-hmm. So talking about that, New Zealand, and so that's where I was kind of theming my stories today. So, you know, kind of highlighted a couple species that are in trouble. Good news is that New Zealand is aware of it. Now, New Zealand and the Department of Conservation has developed an algorithm. And they're using this. I like this, math. Yeah, they're using this to decide what species to save. And the, the title of this article is, How Do We so- Decide Which Endangered Species to Save? Mm-hmm. I remember years ago, it, it sitting in my office there in Florida, reading an article about conservation officials, and this is probably like five years ago, having to make the tough decisions. And sure. part of the argument, and I think we talked about this with the California condor, part of the argument brought was, you know, they spent millions to save this one bird. And, you know, why didn't they s- spread that money across many species? You could have saved more species than just one bird. And I think you and I went back and said, well, true, but that put conservation in people's faces in the 80s and 90s when nobody was thinking about this stuff, right? So yeah, the California condor did serve its purpose, not just in what the zoos did to save that species, but to educate the public. Correct. Because back then in the 80s, nobody cared right. you know, or, or didn't care as much, right? So the... Department of Conservation here in New Zealand has developed this algorithm and they developed uh, using this, they've come up with a list of 150 priority species to save. Now, what makes this article interesting is just not like, oh, these are the species that are endangered here. So their strategy isn't so much to say, hey, we're going to go save this species. Let's go find them in the wild or protect them. It's let's save the ecosystem. That makes sense. And mm-hmm. so they want... Yeah, so they want to integrate saving these species with saving their ecosystem. So right, that's so maybe the whole gist of it. If they look at ecosystems, which ecosystems can they save the most, get the best bang for their buck? Exactly. That's save exactly the what they're species. doing. Yeah, that's yep. smart. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they, you know, it's interesting reading this article. They talk about it's hard to sell to the public, oh, we're saving this ecosystem sure. versus selling to the public oh we're saving the little brown spot or the little spotted kiwi yeah you know, i can see people I can are, see that mm-hmm. yeah it's like you know oh do you want to you know save you know a thousand hectares of this forest which by the way this kiwi lives in and this species lives in and this species lives in um or do you want to save the little spotted kiwi people are gonna be like oh save the little spotted kiwi you know that's just yeah, right because it's that's a, it's a different type of thinking and yeah. even you and I just talking about plants a little bit ago, early when we opened up and plant genetics, right. uh, you and I stumbled through it because it's not our area of expertise. I love trees mm-hmm. and plants and anything green for sure. But yeah, I don't know mm-hmm. a lot about it. And of course, I'm more, my heartstrings get tugged more on uh, an animal than it probably yeah. does a plant, yeah. which is wrong. Yeah. That's actually not the right thinking. Yeah, plants, I know. Plants are just as important to their ecosystems and the purpose that they serve as well. So no, mm-hmm. no, that's mm-hmm. very good. No, you're actually opening my eyes up with that story. So I appreciate what. No, I thought it was cool. Yeah, I thought share. it was cool. And so just to kind of wrap this up with New Zealand, the DOC or Department of Conservation, they manage. So our conservation land that's set aside for conservation in New Zealand is one third of the country. Wow. That's awesome, so, Chris. Yeah. Holy shnikes. Yeah. Could you imagine one third of the US is like, nope, you know, this yeah, is all about protected. That. No way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so especially you know, with the I current friend, administration, it's like, oh, yeah, they, they would, yeah, they, that third would be gone quick. But yeah, I thought it was really cool. I didn't realize it was that much is set aside yeah, for conservation. That's awesome. So, well, and then kind of keeping up with your theme about yeah. land conservation. So, in looking for some conservation products I could potentially promote or share with the audience that I have been using recently, I stumbled upon the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. This is a conservation giveaway for endangered species chocolate. And for listeners out there that aren't familiar, they're pretty common, at least in the United States. They're chocolate bars that can be found at your local grocery store. 
that are they're called it's called endangered species chocolate and a percent of mm. if you buy the chocolate a percent of money goes directly to different and um, different conservation animal groups so right. for john and i it's it's a tad bit more expensive but we've committed to buying it if we are gonna a we like good chocolate and b if we are gonna spend yeah. the money why not we like to vote with our dollar, right? So right, we like to support right, companies right. that support our beliefs. So what I found is that endangered species chocolate paired up with a conservation group called Rainforest Trust. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Rainforest mm -hmm. Trust, we have not highlighted on any of our species podcasts, but spoiler alert, they'll be coming up soon because they're yep, awesome. Yep. What this group does is they actually purchase land to protect the world's tropical forests. And so what this group will do is Rainforest Trust will purchase tr threatened tropical forests, and therefore they save endangered wildlife through the partnerships uh, and community engagement where they purchase the land. And they promote highly effective partnerships and long-term protection of the ecosystem that they pur purchase. And so Rainforest Trust is holding a contest that runs until August 12th. So everybody has a few weeks that if you go on the, onto their website, um, rainforesttrust.org, that you can click on a link and basically enter your information and you'll be automatically entered to win up to a year's worth of chocolate from endangered species. Nice. So, I mean, you don't, yeah, nice. you don't know money, nothing. You're, you just give them your email and your name, no harm, no foul. I highly recommend you do that. Now there's also, besides a year's supply worth of chocolate, which would be amazing. <laughs> the chocolate's really good if you haven't had it, mm -hmm. but they also give like little prizes throughout yeah, yeah. and incentives and their website's beautiful. But if you give a donation, you can help save elephants. So they've teamed up. Mm-hmm different elephant conservation groups to give money towards elephant conservation. So if you do a $10 donation, you get a hundred extra entries to win free chocolate. And of course the money goes directly to elephant conservation. So I went ahead and mm -hmm, donated mm -hmm. $30. So I have, I have 300 extra <laughs> yeah. entries and I was like, oh. and I was thinking, I was yeah. teasing myself. I'm like, boy, this podcast is getting expensive. However, yeah. <laughs> However, I have a chance to win chocolate for a year. Like if I win that chocolate, my husband will be very happy with that. It's like the best $30 we've ever spent. <laughs> and let alone yeah. that we buy the chocolate anyways. So the fact that it's going to mm -hmm. elephant conservation because of this amazing um, partnership between endangered species chocolate and rainforest trust is awesome. So check it out. Yeah. I yeah. was like, it's one thing to just give money to a conservation group because you believe them, believe in them. And I highly recommend that course i have my favorite charities mm -hmm. and a lot of them that i promote on the podcast but it's one thing mm -hmm. to like for free potentially win chocolate for a year and then maybe if you give a little bit of money like five or ten bucks you could like have basically yeah. you know ten times more of a chance to win chocolate for a year so it's just, it's yeah it's a good game no, it's good yeah it's good. i i i I'm really yeah, yeah, yeah. glad to see people teaming up to smart marketing and getting people motivated and talking about it. So we'll put, we'll put some links up in the show notes yeah. to get everybody involved because chocolate yeah. makes people happy. Yeah, no, it was interesting. You said that because uh, the, the one thing I forgot to mention in that doc article, getting people excited was they're like, you know, we need a biodiversity forecast in the news, you know? So they're, they're, they're pushing for like here in New Zealand, at least in between the weather and the, finance report or whatever they're like okay this week in conservation or biodiversity here's how our species are doing kiwi went up 10 birds that's awesome you know, this this skink went down 10 skinks we should died do, this week. chris you know, tell him to hire us know. we need jobs yeah, yeah i know because I, I actually oh, have shit, one shit. one of my conservation oh, success stories just to skip ahead about my favorite animal yeah. ever the grevy's zebra so there's three Three species yes. of zebra, but one of them called the Grevy zebra is highly endangered. Mm -hmm. And they live in Kenya and Ethiopia. And the, a group that I follow and I'll promote here whenever we do decide to do uh, zebra is it's called Grevy Zebra Trust. Mm -hmm. But they recently reported that in 2018, the population of Grevy zebra in Kenya reserves went up about 500 from 
2016 to 2018. So they used to be 2,300 and now they're a little over 2,800. So super exciting news. Mm -hmm. And the people that were doing the count for the Grevy's Trust were all, were all volunteers. And it was called Citizen Science, Citizen Scientists that drove over Mm -hmm. 25,000 square kilometers to find these and count these Grevy zebras. So I, whenever they do that next, I think you and I should partake in it. <laughs> Maybe bring a video cam and a documentary or do, do the yeah. podcast down the road. But yeah, it just goes to show like that's yeah, a yeah. super exciting report uh, because they're working really hard over there in, in Kenya. And uh, one of the, my dream reserves to go to is one called Lewa, which I'll highlight sometime in Kenya. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got to go there with our families for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so see if that was an if we could do that forecast, Grevy Zebra up five hundred. That is yeah, amazing. Yeah, yes, that's nice. That's really nice. That's really nice. Yeah, we look. Yeah, we'll definitely be covering uh, zebra at some point. I know you're itching. That's one of your itches. That we well, need yeah, to, uh, it's kind of, but it's kind of like the uh, eventually. once we do it, I might just stop doing the podcast because I have like we'll hit, yeah, hit my high well, mark. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll do that one in ten years. Yeah, there then. you go. No. All right. So this last article, it's outside New Zealand to an extent, and I thought this was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And the the headline is, Indigenous Peoples are Crucial for Conservation. Mm-hmm. A quarter of all land is in their hands. Mm. So this was really cool. You know, what they're saying is the Indigenous Peoples around the earth make up about 5% total of the global population. Okay. Okay. So these are people that consider themselves indigenous or they're, they have been identified as indigenous populations. So it's tiny. Their population's tiny, but they cover 38 million square kilometers or about a quarter of all land. Now you take away Antarctica, but all, you know, the, the other continents is made up of indigenous people. And there's actually a really cool map that I'll, I'll put on the show notes showing about the, the density of where they live. And what they're talking about is about 65% of indigenous lands have not been intensely okay. developed, you know, compared with, uh, you know, 44% of the other lands have. And they're talking about is we need to, or conservation experts or officials need to work with the indigenous people to maintain these ecosystems. Right. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was really cool. It was a really interesting take on it that I'd never really, again, had not thought about. Now, they do talk about, and, and, and I'll quote you know, the article right, here, right now, conservation partnerships will only be successful if the rights, knowledge systems, and practices of indigenous peoples are fully acknowledged because there is no one size that fits mm-hmm. all. Their indigenous peoples are hugely diverse. So let's say what, what would work with the Maasai in Kenya or in East Africa would not work with indigenous people, say, in Peru. Sure. You know, right. they have different, different cultures, cultures, belief mm-hmm. systems. Of course. All right. No, and Chris, that's a, yeah, it's really fascinating. You know, again, when we're, we're learning, you know, doing this podcast, doing each species each week, talking to all these experts from around the world. It really makes you think you're like, yeah, you know, nobody thinks about them. And, you know, we don't want to go in and tell them, hey, you need to do this. But we learn about that culture. We go in and say, hey, we recognize the land you occupy is critically important. So we're going to help. You know, how can we help you keep it safe, I guess, or or maintain it? No, Chris, this is a that's a fascinating story. And it's so funny. You must you and I must be on the same brain wave. This Probably. Week. <laughs> because my next story is exactly what you're mm-hmm. talking about. It's a really just it gives me goosebumps. Mm-hmm. I went and I'm following this group now on Facebook. But it's a conservation success story out of Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. And what it is is an all female indigenous mm, local okay, people ranger teams. Okay. Okay. And so they have been innovated and integrated to defend wildlife in the areas that they live near. Mm -hmm. And this is the brainchild by a, um, a gentleman named Damien Mander, who has been 
pretty, uh, he's actually Australian born. So shout out to the Aussies. And he spent many, many years on the front lines, helping protect rhinos and other, other wildlife in different African nations. And he launched this program, this all women female ranger team in 2017. It's called the Akashinga program or the brave Mm -hmm. ones in Shona. Mm -hmm. And it's focused on developing a new force of all female wildlife rangers to protect rhinos, elephants, and other wildlife from poachers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And its goal is to seek applicants that are the indigenous people that are the most vulnerable females in these rural areas. So he'll recruit abuse survivors, abandoned wives, orphans, sex workers, single mothers, basically women who he said they're not necessarily victims of circumstances, they're mm-hmm. victims of men, which I found that to be mm-hmm. very fascinating. Mm-hmm. And typically... For those that aren't as familiar with a lot of the anti-poaching movements in the different countries in Africa, it's it's very um, combative and a mil- it involves military and a lot of force, which is fine and somewhat works. But Damien Mander wanted to come in with like a, do- a new model, basically, and focus mm-hmm. on the rural commu- communities and the personal connections. So he employs these locals, which are all women. And he does train them to deal with firearm safety, policies, dangerous wildlife, um, first aid, human rights, uh, leadership, patrolling, search and arrest. So he Mm -hmm. gives them a a whole new skill set that is obviously, since they've been kind of either forgotten about in their culture or dehumanized a little bit. Right, right, Um, right. So, yeah, and they're doing really, really well. So. He, I think there's about 36 of them that have gone through ranger training because it's mm-hmm. you've been through boot camp, but from what I read, yeah, what yeah. I read in the article, it sounds very similar to boot camp, like all this probably, probably all this training, yeah. right? All this firearm safety and first aid and yeah. all this stuff. Uh, but it's so popular that when they had their last graduation, which I'm sure you can remember from your boot mm-hmm. camp and your military days, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. over 2,000 people attended the graduation of the of the Akashinga team last year. And so they're like role models for other women and other kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you ask or you wonder, are they getting results? Heck, yes, they are. Uh, So far, the Akashinga (laughs) team has had about 60 arrests, and that's resulted in more than 41 years of jail sentences. And the crimes have been everything from ivory smuggling to zebra poaching, which that makes me angry, Mm -hmm. and sable antelope snaring, which also makes me angry. I got to work with sable antelopes, the most, the largest antelope species in Africa. They're gorgeous. We'll we'll cover them sometime. So they're helping, they're helping get the bad guys and it's awesome. And once again, it just goes to show that getting the right people on board for the right mission. um, And there was one quote in there that just struck me as fascinating. He said that, um, these women, they, they don't seem that they're corruptible because a lot of times, right. unfortunately, right. desperate yeah. times call for desperate measures. And sometimes people mm-hmm. that are trained to be anti-poachers or protect wildlife might be tempted and bribed to go to the other side. Right, right. Look the other way. Look yeah. the other way. And so yeah. far, these women, just because of the pride and the fact that they've been brought up and given so much self-esteem and self-worth that uh, they're really they're in it for the and they know the land and they're in it for the long haul and they're really helping save some of these megafauna, which is awesome. I hope I hope, I hope you women save the world because us men are screwed it up. Thank you. I didn't want to say it, so. <laughs> you said it. Hey, come on now. No, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm I am a man and I'm doing this. And our, our friend Jonathan up in British Columbia, shout out to him. He's out tromping in the woods, doing good stuff. So. Yeah, no. Yaga Leonard in Vietnam. He's doing yeah, no, there's but a yeah, lot of right, men, but it's right. great to it's... bring some of the women on board and uh, and get them involved too. Like women, women can yeah, do yeah, first yeah. aid and use firearm safety. You oh know? yeah, absolutely. So... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I I had some amazing uh, friends in the military that were female. I mean, they were amazing. So yeah. So a shout um, out to Damian yeah, Mander and power, his yeah. uh, and his at, yeah. and his Akashinga program. If I'm saying that right. Yeah, but we'll yeah, put a link awesome. on our show notes. Well, speaking of Aussies, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So speaking of Aussies, yeah. So it's, it's good. It's, this is all kind of just tied in. It just kind of fell in place this week. 
But this one was a new species discovered in Australia. Oh. And it's called the Bandy Bandy Snake. I love its name. So the Bandy Bandies is a family of burrowing snakes. Mm -hmm. And this was in the western part of the country. They were out looking for sea snakes. Okay. Now, talk about, we're talking about, you know, these islands and invasive species and things like that. This bandy bandy snake, they, they, it crawled out of all this stone that was getting mined. It was about to get loaded onto a ship. Oh, cool. And so, so it slithered out from there, <laughs> but it had like, obviously ah, been in there. Yeah. What's this? Yeah. And then they discovered this, this bandy bandy snake, but it just showed you, you know, how this happens because that boat was going to go across the sea. Sure. And they're, they're mining. Oh, what's the, it's, bauxite so it's like what we make aluminum out of okay so this is a very popular uh thing in western australia to mine for this but that snake was in that rubble and it could have gotten on the boat with say there's a male and a female or maybe a small group on the boat or another boat they're taken to say india or you know wherever china wherever they're going to go to to convert this to aluminum and now that snake gets off and all of a sudden slithers away with a mate. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you have an invasive species. So that's how this stuff's happening. Now, what's interesting about this specific one is they, they warned, first of all, it's venomous, but very mild okay. venom. So it's not, you know, deadly or anything like that. They did say that already it's endangered. Wow. So, <laughs> because of this mining. Yeah. yeah. So th they're, they're applying for protection on this bandy bandy snake. But I thought it was cool. I thought it was like, wow, this sounded like a cool one. And it's really cool looking. So Ooh, I will please put that do. on show notes. Well, yeah. it just goes yeah. to show around every twist and turn, there's new species that are being found. Yep. Yep. All the time. All the time. Well, Chris, that's really cool. And I look forward to seeing the Bandy Bandy on the show notes. But what I want to give a shout out to this week is not necessarily a new species, but perhaps the ability to save a lot of species and maybe provoke, promote finding new ones is that it's starting to be really trendy almost that big corporations such as Starbucks and the Marriott hotel chain is saying no to plastic straws. And there's a whole group of other organizations out there that I have not listed. So um, I apologize if I skipped any one mm -hmm. major, please bring it to my attention. But yes, yeah, so there is a movement. You and I have been talking about the movement, and I really want to highlight that great news. Obviously, Starbucks is a huge one. Now, following some of the social media, yeah. there are some people that are taking a step further and saying, okay, Starbucks, that's great about no straws, but what about lids and cups and and all that? And I, and mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, however, I think we have to yeah. applaud a first step and keep voting with our dollar and such and things right. like that. So- um, keep, you know, I want these companies to keep up the good work and I want the public to keep the pressure on, right? To last few weeks, we've been talking about the, the groundswell of anti-plastic yeah. emotions. It's really great. Yeah. And the other story I came across, which is super awesome is Sir David Attenborough, mm -hmm. who is obviously one of the world's best known mm -hmm. natural history filmmakers, naturalist, mm -hmm. um, and he's been around for like 60 years. Yeah. So very, very well known, very well respected. He has launched a new initiative to target advertising industry mm -hmm. to garner wildlife funding from them with a goal to have advertising partners contribute 0.5% of their media to wildlife conservation initiatives. Mm -hmm. So the program is called the Lion's Share, and it was developed between the United Nations and um, an Australian-based production company. Mm -hmm. It is an Australia theme today, or a, a mm -hmm. or Australia New Zealand theme today. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Called, it called Finch and Climminger, BBDO. And what Sir David Attenborough wanted to bring atten brings attention to with the public is that images of animals appear in approximately twenty percent of all advertisements that we see. Twenty mm percent, -hmm. Chris. There's yeah, animals. That's in a there. lot. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. But but you know, marketers know that people love animals and love seeing them, right? But yet, despite yeah. this, the animals don't always res you know receive support that they deserve. So, another statistic shows that nine out of ten of the most popular animals that we actually see in these commercials are endangered mm -hmm. or threatened. And once again, right. They, right. Don't, they don't see any support. 
Right, right, yeah. So the lion, like, yeah, I always see tigers and oh, lions yeah. and stuff. Right, orangutans, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the lion shares goal, um, backed by Sir David Attenborough, seek uh, seeks to raise over a hundred million a year within the next three years, and hopes to basically contribute several millions of dollars to animal conservation within the first year. And obviously, throughout his ten year career, he's had a lot of support from people that make money off animal commercials or advertising. So mm-hmm. I think it's great that he's like calling them out and he's trying to put together a committee, a steering committee on how to figure out how to get money from these different groups. So yeah, it's a little, it's a little thing. Like I would have yeah. never thought of that. It's a great idea. I mean, what can they say? Like if they're like using a tiger yeah, in one yeah, of their yeah. commercials, can they really say no? I mean, but mm-hmm. many people have many different talents. And so whether you're an artist or a musician or mm-hmm. in advertising or a filmmaker, like there's definitely little things you can do mm-hmm. to help support conservation. And I would go as far to say like Chris and I, of course, love animals. Yeah. That's why we do this yeah. whole podcast in general. But I think Chris and I are really seeing that conservation is not just animals, but it's the habitats that they live in. It's it's the you know the ocean, the trees, all mm-hmm. of that. So there's maybe you're not a fan of animals, d- but maybe yeah. you like trees or oceans or streams or mountains. So are you like oxygen? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you like right. uh, yeah, oxygen's important. Yes, unless yeah, you're a plant. That's a good point. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But that's a good point. No, that's a really good point. And you know, this week, sorry, Jim, Jim Wine Press. This week was actually pretty interesting, exciting, good news. Like usually when Jim's on, it's bad, sad news. <laughs> like, oh, I'm sure we'll be back uh, next week with some doozies. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, it's interesting. It's great New Zealand week. I am back from my little vacation. You're back from your vacation. It's time so, to go to work. Yeah, we have a big episode next week. Big episode and a big interview that Angie got for Thursday. So I'm excited. I'm excited for next week. Too. I'm like cheesing from ear to ear. My smile's yeah. so big about that interview. It's a good one. And it's I made a, a new one. BFF. So I don't know if she can, I yep, don't know if she can yep. hire me, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but yeah, stay tuned for that next week and we'll see you then. Yes. Thank you everyone for listening. Happy conservation and zookeeper week. <laughs>